Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. My name is Katie Parker and I work as a local foods and small farms educator with the University of Illinois Extension. Uh, you're probably realizing that I am not Chris in Roth, uh, and I hope you can definitely tell a difference between our voices. Uh, but today, Chris has abandoned us for his son's birthday. Uh, so happy birthday to Chris's son. Um, but we are joined by our forever faithful friend, Ken Johnson. Ken, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Very good. I think, I think Chris is supposed to be in a lake, in a boat, fishing <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> is, is it a... a an actual lake or a lake from all the rain that we've gotten lately? <laughs> <laughs> well, if he's fishing, hopefully it's an actual lake. <laughs> right. <laughs> so <clears throat> I know this, this weekend, a lot of people got a lot of weather or a lot of, a lot of weather, a lot of rain. I know here in Jacksonville, they're talking about you know, 1.5 or eight inches and we got less than half an inch in town. So a little disappointing from that stretch from that perspective we had to water and everything but yeah that would be kind of disappointing um <laughs> i think we got close to three inches so we had almost depleted our rain barrel from last time it had rained uh so it was nice to get that filled back up but i know some areas they had much worse they had excessive rain um anywhere from like three to six inches uh, and then they also had some strong winds as well as um, some hail, some good sized hail. So that would uh, not be quite as fun. And I know up in, up in Cass County, they had a few tornadoes up there too. Oh, wow. Touchdown, yeah. So. Did they have much damage there? Um, I haven't heard um, about there being too much. I think there's a little bit here and there, but nothing. I have not heard of anything major uh, damage good. wise, which is good. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's crazy though. Um, I was reading today that up in northern Illinois, northern Illinois, um, they're actually doing. Forgive me if I'm incorrect, but I think they are um, considering it a disaster because of a drought. They've had a prolonged period of time. They they haven't received any rain, uh, so that's kind of the exact opposite of what we're experiencing here in central Illinois. It's, it's kind of crazy how different parts of the state can be. I mean, mm -hmm. you kind of forget how long Illinois is sometimes, but oh, yeah, from, from north to south, how, how different things can be weather wise, rain wise, and stuff sometimes, right? Yeah, so, um, like you said, it was a timely rain. So, uh, for much of us, um, you'll probably have to water again here soon since you didn't get quite as much as the rest of the state. Um, but there are some problems that do occur with the excessive rain, uh, and some of those we'll discuss here today and talk about how we can uh, prevent them or uh, manage any of those issues that we do see with excessive rain. So one that we frequently see with excessive rain is the potential of um, more, more diseases. So I don't know if you've been getting more frequent calls, Ken, about any diseases or any common diseases we see with wet, humid weather? I um, haven't gotten too many, and I haven't noticed much yet in our garden. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, with, with wet weather, that's, you know, especially wet, humid weather, that's kind of perfect conditions for a lot of disease. A lot of diseases need water sitting on the leaves. They need next kind of free water on leaves in order to get in, germinate and kind of get into those leaves. So the longer the leaves are wet, um, you know, the more chances you have getting disease developing. And then with all that rain splash, that helps spread those spores that are those um, leaf spots and stuff are creating. That splash just spreads that stuff throughout your plants too. So yeah, we've had, we've had some really good conditions for diseases. So if you had disease in your plants before the rain, um, you may want to go out and check and it may be time to start spraying um, to protect some of those some of those leaves that aren't infected yet. Yeah, we haven't noticed any disease in our um, gardens as either. I did harvest some um, some crops from our high tunnel today, um, and it wouldn't be experiencing quite as much of the the wet weather because it is covered. Uh, but it would have that humid environment because there's uh, because it is covered. Um, but we have some some powdery mildew developing 
on some of our zucchini plants, um, but it's it's not terrible at all. And uh, I would expect that we could probably be fine until uh, we're done producing uh, squash from that plant. So that's yeah. fortunate. So say, and, and powdery mildew is one of those exceptions that actually doesn't like having water on the leaves. That kind of washes everything off. So right. all the rain may be good for powdery mildew. <laughs> for getting right. that, but if it gets nice and humid, then yeah, that powdery mildew will start mm -hmm. going crazy. And that's kind of what we're go ahead. I had to pull a bunch of peas um this weekend because they were they're pretty much white. I mean they're kind of declining anyway, but it looked like it snowed on them. There's so much powdery mildew on them. So wow. Pull those, get those out of there, and then later this year we'll we'll plant some more for more of a fall harvest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely nice about those cooler season crops is you can come back in and, and get another production or harvest with those. So like you had mentioned, um, you mentioned preventing rain splash. Is there anything that we can do um, to help to prevent that from occurring in the garden? Um, so okay, kind of one thing is mulching. Um, a lot of these diseases we get in our plants, especially a lot of tomato diseases, um, those foliar diseases, they will get into peppers and and potatoes too. Those those spores from those diseases kind of overwinter in the soil or in the, the plant debris on the soil. So if you've got a layer of mulch on there, that kind of prevents some of that that rain splash from that soil up onto your leaves. That's kind of that's one of the main ways you can prevent some of that foliar disease. In addition to to rotating your crops and stuff, but that can that can go a long way in preventing a lot of that. Um, also, don't go out into your garden while the leaves are wet. Um, you know, if you're going out scouting, make sure stuff is dry. You're going out harvesting crop or your vegetables. Make sure those leaves are dry because if there's any disease on there and you brush up against it or you're handling those leaves, you may pick up some of that, those spores and stuff and then transfer that from plant to plant. So let that stuff dry out before you get out into your garden. Yeah, and it's always a good idea to just wait. Nobody likes to have wet clothes for the rest of the day. Yeah, this is another <laughs> benefit of waiting. <laughs> right. I remember detasseling was always miserable because you had to, it's always so wet in the morning. So then you had mentioned there had been some, some hail and stuff. Is there any concern with like it's vegetables or even, you know, your corn and soybeans with, with hail damage to those? Oh yeah, definitely. So uh, it really depends on the growth stage that the crops were at. Um, so there's a lot of graphs out there that are helpful for determining what the impact would be on your corn and soybeans. Um, so typically, uh, it like I said, it depends on the growth stage. So right now we're noticing a lot of our corn tasseling. So this is where we're really determining yield uh, with pollination. And so um, any reduction in leaf surface area uh, can have an impact on yield. Um, and those charts are really helpful because it helps you determine like if you have a 10% reduction in leaf biomass, then you can expect like a 13% loss in yield. Um, that's, those aren't exact numbers. Those are just uh, something that I'm throwing out there. Uh, but we can put a link to some uh, of those tables to help you uh, get an idea of what could be happening. Uh, and the same goes with soybeans. Our soybeans are far enough along that uh, we're not totally worried about um, killing the soybeans. There's more of a concern when soybeans are young, when hail hits like the cotyledons, if it broke off the cotyledons, that's the growing point. Um, and so there's a good chance that that would kill the plant, but we're way past that. Uh, and so there's a greater chance that we're just losing leaf area, uh, which again would hurt photosynthesis. And in the long run would hurt yield. Um, so it makes it even more important to protect those leaves that are left on the plants. So those plants have been severely damaged. Um, and so I don't know about you, but um, I've been hearing a lot of crop dusters out the last couple of days and they have been nonstop. Um, and so what those guys are doing is they're likely spraying fungicide or insecticide over corn and soybean fields. And that's going to help to protect the, those damaged plants or uh, any of those plants out there that from any potential uh, disease or insects. 
Yeah, I haven't. I live in the middle of town, so I haven't seen any, any <laughs> That's <thing> probably I... <laughs> best. <laughs> but no, they've just been, he, sometimes whenever the crop dusters are out, I, I wonder if that's what it was like um, being in like a, a war zone or something, because they're just constant. <laughs> Buzzing all the time. Right. See, I've, I've driven, been driving down the road sometimes, and they've, they've flown across, and it looks like they're going to land on the, the roof of your car sometimes. Right. <laughs> yeah, they get really close. It's definitely a, a skill, one that I don't think I have the courage to do. <laughs> no. <laughs> have to have some good life insurance, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll say for another thing, for like your hail damage, you know, that, that damage that, that hail is causing those plants, they're kind of providing those wounds, that opening. That's another good way for disease and stuff to get in. So if you're in an area where you had some hail damage, you know, kind of garden crops wise, you know, it'd be a good idea to start taking a good look at that stuff and, and keep a close eye on that stuff. Um, if you didn't have any disease, I would just kind of keep an eye on it. Mm -hmm. If you already had some, some disease showing up in your plants, it may be a good idea to, to start spraying um, some stuff that kind of proactively to prevent that from getting into your plants. Um, Cause with all those wounds and all that opening, it's, you know, it's going to be really easy for that stuff to get in there. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, with your peas, they weren't damaged or anything, but uh, you'd notice kind of the, the disease that had taken over and there wasn't really much of a future for those plants. So you just removed them. And so uh, if you already had issues that were kind of far enough along with your plants earlier uh, before you had more damage, uh, removal might be a good option too, to keep it from spreading or keeping it from going, um, being an issue in, in future years as well. Yeah, sometimes it's better to sacrifice a few plants Right. And let everything, then hold on a little bit longer and let everything get wiped out. Right. If you've got, you know, 15 tomato plants and one looks really bad, you're probably better off just pulling that bad one and, and trying to protect all those others instead of letting that kind of fester and spread throughout everything and wiping everything out in a few weeks. Speaking of wiped out, uh, if you got enough rain in areas, uh, you might have potentially had some flooding. And with flooding can cause some issues in your garden as well. So um, I've had a question in the past about their garden has been flooded. And so can, is it safe for people to eat produce out of their garden if it has been flooded? I think a little bit of it depends on kind of where that flood water is coming from. You know, we just got a lot of rain and it just, you know, didn't soak into the ground fast enough. There's a little less concern with that. Whereas if, you know, you got kind of citywide flooding where you've got sewage and and rivers flood and you don't know what's in that water. Um, that's a little bit more of a concern, um, but kind of general rule of thumb, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. Um, you know, if that stuff is, you know, you have squash or, or pumpkin stuff like that on the ground, um, they're sitting in that flood water that may not be the best idea to harvest those. Um, the, those fruit that were sitting in it, um, you know, if they're immature and they, they haven't fully developed, maybe you could be probably better off not doing it. Uh, tomatoes, pepper stuff that's off, off, up off the ground and they didn't come into contact with the floodwaters. Those would, would probably be okay. Um, you know, your, your leafy vegetables, you know, since we're, especially since you're eating those raw a lot of times, it's probably best not to harvest those. Um, root crops, um, I mean, that can get kind of tricky and kind of depending on where the floodwaters from, but a lot of times, you know, you're peeling those and cooking them so that maybe you know those may be safe to eat depending on again where that flood water is coming from if it's got what those contaminants are if it's you know it's just yeah. kind of sanding water in your yard because it didn't drain fast enough it's probably okay but if it's you've got sewage or industrial waste all that kind of fun stuff you probably don't want to be eating uh -huh. that even if you cook it <laughs> Right, a hog lagoon down the road. Yeah. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those those tricky things, but you know, so a lot of times it's just better to be safe than sorry. Um, if, if those plants didn't die, they'll, they'll put out more produce for you. So you know, if, if you're not comfortable with it, you know, put them in the compost and, and wait till you get that, that next kind of round of, of vegetables and stuff coming in. Now, if you have reoccurring issues with excessive rainwater are there any ways to um anything that you can do to help to uh, manage that or to 
um, help alleviate those problems? Um, you know, some of it could be, you know, kind of looking at how the water drains on your property and if it's, you know, that it likes to stand in one area, you probably don't want to put your vegetable garden there or plant stuff, or if you're going to plant stuff, plant stuff that's a little more um, tolerant of, of wet, speed, wet feet, so to speak, we can handle some of that standing water. Um, you know, if you've got new rerouting gutter, stuff like that, you could build something like a rain garden to collect some of that water coming off um, the roof. And that'll kind of, that may fill up, it'll allow it to slowly infiltrate um, into the ground. But the, those rain gardens will kind of help keep some of that water out of the storm drains and stuff, um, reduce some of that load um, in there. Um, I know, I don't know a terrible amount about rain gardens. I know enough <laughs> to be dangerous. <laughs> that was always Chris's strong yeah. point. Where's Chris when you need him? <laughs> right, <laughs> out on the boat. <laughs> but Maybe yeah, if you, have have any, if you have any questions, you can contact Chris, contact Chris. about rain gardens. So I don't know, if, have we done an episode on that before, on rain gardens? Um, can't remember, Eliana, did we talk to Eliana about that? And we talked to her. I don't remember what we talked to her about. <laughs> See, like a year ago. <laughs> talked to a person a week. <laughs> they all start to live together. <laughs> so maybe we haven't. If we haven't, that may be a, a good topic for a future one. Right. Yep. One thing I have noticed uh, when being out in our, our yard scouting uh, for diseases and such, I have been noticing a lot of insects this year. And it's kind of fun uh, to take some pictures, use for presentation and such. Um, but this week, or this past week, Ken, in your article, you wrote about beneficial insects. And so do you wanna talk a little bit about the article that you wrote? Sure. So, yeah, so a lot of times, I think, maybe not the listeners of this show, but it kind of, it's society in general. I think a lot of times we think any bug is a bad, if it's a bug, it's bad. Um, we've probably gotten to the point where butterflies and bees are okay, but still most other things, if it's got six legs, or eight legs or, or more than anything more than four legs <laughs> for most people should probably be dead. It's kind of the approach a lot of people take. Um, but there are a lot of good bugs in our garden. It's something like less than 1% of that, all insects are actually considered pests. So most of them are, are beneficial or they're not really affecting us, at least from a human perspective, they're beneficial. Um, so yeah, so I talked about some of the common um, predatory insects, natural enemies, parasitoids we have in our gardens. And I took some pictures this was two weeks ago. That kind of what gave me the idea for the article of, uh, again, I was out looking in my garden too and found a bunch of aphids all over some of our sunflower plants. There's probably a couple hundred aphids on there. Um, but I looked a little bit closer and I noticed um, um, there's some lacewing eggs on there. Um, there were some surfeit fly larvae. Um, so the babies of those, um, as well as a, a parasitoid wasp burning around on there. And I had found, found some mummies aphid mummies on there too, where the, the wasp had laid the egg in there and the, uh, the wasp larvae had eaten the inside of the aphid and stuff. Um, so I kind of, so I took some pictures of that and I put those pictures in the blog, but I went back um, last week before I posted the blog to see you know, if I get any of the pictures of the, the lacewing eggs that they had hatched and those larvae were out. Um, I went back to that plant and I could not find a single aphid. So in less than a week, um, they had cleaned up all of those aphids. So a lot of our our small soft-bodied pests, our aphids, um, things like that. A lot of times when those natural enemies move in, they'll, they'll clear them out for you and you don't really need to do um, anything for them. Kind of nature, nature will control a lot of that stuff uh, for you. So I guess kind of the, the moral of the, this long-winded story is to, you know, if you are scouting and you find a bunch of pests, especially insects, uh, take a little bit of a closer look and see if you have any of these natural enemies around. And if you do, um, you know, you may not need to do anything uh, about them. You may want to go back in a, a few, three, two or three days and see if they've, those populations, pest populations have gone down and down. If they have, you know, you may not need to do anything, no spraying, um, no squishing, nothing. Especially for the small stuff, the, the bigger stuff, Japanese beetles, there, there's not too much out there other than birds that are really going to eat those. So still have to control those, but the little guys, Lots of stuff like to eat them. Yeah, it's definitely fascinating. Uh, we we have been spending more time on our deck this season, and 
it's fun to look at all the insects that are in our house plants. Uh, I saw an assassin bug that had pierced and they suck out of other insects, right? Because there's a, a dead guy just next to him. Uh, so it's really cool to, to see those at work and in our gardens. And uh, I would always say hesitate on spraying any insecticides in your gardens because you're killing those beneficial insects as well. Um, and there are potential issues that can further develop from that. Yeah, especially some of those, those more broad spectrum insecticides that kind of kill a wide swath of insects. You know, the, those are killing your pests. They're also killing your beneficials. Mm -hmm. Whether those be your predators, your parasitoids, your pollinators, all of those things can be affected. You know, if, you, you know, if you're going to spray, try to get those more specific, like your, your BTs, your BTK that only works on caterpillars. Um, you know, your other stuff is going to be fine. Um, and especially when with ornamentals and stuff, I, th I think we need to have a higher tolerance with pests. Because a lot of people still get questions about milkweed. You know, I've got aphids all over them. I've got milkweed bugs all over them. How do I get rid of them? You know, you're, you're, if you're growing those for, for monarchs, there's really not much you can do um, for that. Those caterpillars need to feed on that. You can't spray for that stuff. And, you know, if you're letting the monarchs eat your milkweed, why can't, why can't the other insects eat it too? <laughs> I will have to say though, aphids are pretty pesky. <laughs> <laughs> they are, and they, those populations can can explode. Take off, yeah. Rather rather quickly, so. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, if you've got a lot and you don't see any beneficials in there, you may want to do something about it. Well, that was a lot of great information, Ken. Thanks for joining on the podcast today. Hey, thanks for for driving the ship today. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't sunk yet. <laughs> So next week, we'll be meeting with one of our co-workers, Dwayne Friend, and we'll be discussing algal blooms. And we actually have a surprise for you, so you'll definitely have to check back in next week to see what that surprise is. And listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. <laughs>